The Long Bike Ride by Melina Brown, illustrated by Alex Bustick. California's rocky shores are an ideal place to watch the surf crash, to clamber over rocks, and to go exploring, and sometimes that's just the beginning of the day's adventure. Look out for the rock, Jake yelled at me. I turned away from Michael to look straight ahead, but I didn't see any rock. Made you look, laughed Jake, speeding up to pass me. Jake Hernandez and Michael Choi were two, were two of my best friends. I biked with them wherever I could, because Mama didn't like me biking on my own, and I sure wasn't about to go with my little sister, Kiana. Kiana had to stay in her after-school program anyway. Dad had said I was supposed to stay away from certain areas of the old army base, Fort Ord. Unexploded grenades had been buried there, and lead bullets still littered the dunes near old target ranges. He hadn't told me to stay away from the other side of Highway 1, though, probably because he never thought I'd go there. He knows I don't like the water. It's freezing, even in the summer. I had learned about that the hard way, when Michael and Jake first brought me to the beach. I had taken off my t-shirt and run right into the water with nothing on but my swimming trunks. Cold shocked through, like, through my body, like lightning, and I jumped right out. When I ran back, shivering and shouting, both Jake and Michael were doubled over in laughter. Antoine, man, I can't believe you did that, laughed Jake as he zipped up a black rubber outfit. Hey, Antoine, we forgot to tell you. You need a wetsuit around here, Michael had added with concern before breaking out in laughter again. Since then, I'd begged Mama and Dad for one, but Dad said I was lucky I got a mountain bike for my 14th birthday. I'd have to get a job and start saving for anything else I wanted. I tightened my helmet as we bounced over sandy bumps and jumped over mounded cypress tree roots. Cypress trees are so different from the evergreens I saw near the army base in Georgia, where Dad was stationed before being transferred out here. Their branches spread out like flat bunches of needles, like they're trying to reach the water. We rode down a trail past the dunes, avoiding the thorny shrubs and tufts of needle grass. In science, we'd learned how to identify these and other beach plants that grow in the dunes. We also learned that we had to be careful and to ride on the packed wet sand so we didn't contribute to beach erosion. We followed the wet part of the beach as it curved around in wavy arcs. The sky had been steel gray all day, but I didn't care. It felt good to be riding next to the ocean, with wind whipping my face and cold sprinkles of water splashing up from the waves washing ashore. Even though I had just turned 14, I felt like a man. I didn't have to worry about all my parents' rules out here. I was free. I tightened my helmet as we bounced over sandy bumps and jumped over mounded cypress tree roots. We pedaled for a long time, racing and then coasting, until the beach became rocky. Waves crashed against rocky little ridges, sending showers of water into the air. Hey guys, we're almost at the aquarium, Jake pointed straight ahead. I think we've gone at least six miles. Yeah, and I think it's time for a break, Michael said, jumping off of his bike and landing in the sand. Jake joined him, but I rode a little farther toward the rocks. What's the matter? You guys can't go the distance? Hmm? I said, teasing them. I threw my arms in the air over my head as if I'd just won a race. Antoine Graves wins his third triathlon. Antoine, how do you do it? I said in a loud sports announcer's voice. Maybe Michael and Jake were good swimmers, but no one could outdistance me on a bike. Michael shook his head at me, then lay down on the sand. Jake said, Show off! We'll see how far you ride when you wreck your new bike. Then he lay down too. I pedaled until the sand ended. The black cluster of rocks stopped me, blocking my way like a small mountain. I got off my bike and just stood there, a few feet from the waves. I still didn't like the water, but I sure didn't mind being near it. From a distance, the water looked as dark as the steel gray sky. But at my feet, it was so clear I could see the red and peach colored starfish stretching on the rocks like sunbathers. They looked soft and furry, like velvet. I almost expected them to stand up and start swaying with the waves, dancing to the music of the ocean. The mist sprinkled and cooled me down from the ride, but when it really started to chill me, I turned around to head back. Then I heard a loud cry. 
It could not have come from the back cormorants flapping above me. A chill ran down my spine. What was it? I inched my bike closer to the rocks and closer to the harsh hoarse, hoarse cry. If I had been younger and still believed in monsters, I would have guessed it was an evil sea creature. But the more I listened to it, the more it actually sounded like a moaning, yelping cry for help. It sounded like something being tortured. I had to see what it was. I climbed up onto the slippery rock, using my hands the way I'd seen rock climbers do. The rock gurgled and chugged as it splashed into the narrow passages between each rock. I climbed over a few more rocks, peeking down into each cranny. Then I saw the sea creature down in a crevice in the rocks. It wasn't an evil one, though. It stared at me with big, sad, filmy eyes. It was a sea lion pup, and it was stuck. I leaned on the closest rock, trying to avoid the slimy seaweed and curly barnacles coating the sides of it. I reached over the stuck and stuck my hand out to pet the sea lion. Luckily, I was still on the reach, out of the reach, because the sea lion flashed its sharp teeth and tried to bite me, but only its long, stiff whiskers scraped my hand. They looked like porcupine quills and felt like them, too. I looked at the whisker marks on my hand, wondering what would have happened if its teeth had made contact instead. I backed away and watched as the sea lion's nostrils flared up and then closed to let out another wail. Its mouth was like a pink cavern, letting out so much sound I thought people back in Seaside would be able to hear it. But the waves crashed harder against the rocks, drowning out even those scared moans. I looked more closely at the sea lion, trying to see if it was cut or hurt. Its coat looked dark and oily, the same color as the rocks. Its front flippers perched on a rock, but I couldn't see its hind flippers. They must have been wedged in between the rocks. How would it ever get out? Hey, Antoine, came Michael's voice from behind me. We couldn't see you any more. We thought you'd fallen in or something. What are you doing? Before I could answer, Jake's voice jumped in. Wow, it's a seal. You're trying to talk to it or something. He laughed. It's a sea lion, I answered, pointing to its tiny ears, which stuck out like little flaps. I'd learned that sea lions didn't have them. It stuck. The sea lion opened its mouth again to holler, and Jake and Michael laughed at the sound. Let's try to free it, said Michael, reaching toward the sea lion. No, I yelled as he extended his arm. It'll try to bite you. The sea lion lunged at Michael's hand before I could even finish my sentence. Michael pulled back his hand quicker than I had. He didn't even get nicked by the sea lion's whiskers. Whoa! Jake laughed from a safe distance. That little guy is fierce. Michael jumped off the rock and immediately started scanning the nearby sand. He stooped to pick up a long branch, then ran back. We'll use this, he said with a smile. He inched closer to the sea lion again, and I couldn't help feeling annoyed. The sea lion was my discovery, and now Michael was going to poke it with a stick. Leave it alone, Michael, I ordered. It didn't do anything to you. Just relax, Antoine. I'm trying to help free it. Maybe I can just push it out with this branch. Stop, I yelled as Michael moved to poke the sea lion. That's not going to help it. Just put the branch down. The sea lion yelped even more when a loud clap of thunder burst by. We should get out of here, guys, Jake said, inching himself off the rocks. Look at the sky. He pointed to the black clouds hovering over us. Michael threw the branch into the water and shook his head. That thing won't budge. It's really stuck. Man, and now it's going to storm on us. He ran to his bike as if he'd completely forgotten about the stranded sea lion. I stared at the pup again, then at the sky. It would take us a while to get back, and I'd be in serious trouble if I were caught this far away from home. But I didn't want to leave the sea lion alone. What would happen to it? Come on, Anton, Jake yelled back at me. They were already pedaling away. Fat raindrops started pelting me. I had to go. I took one lo last look at the sea lion, then got on my bike and rode away. You're in big trouble, Antoine, Dad said. You should have been back by five o'clock. Kiana looked up at me with wide, worried eyes. I brushed past her and glanced at the kitchen clock. 6.30. Mama worked at the hospital until 8 o'clock on Thursdays. I'd have to face Dad alone. What would I tell him? Would he understand if I told him about the sea lion? He called me before I had a chance to decide. I grabbed the kitchen towel to dry myself, but I was soaking wet. Look at the time, Antoine. What have you been doing? 
Dad tapped his watch so hard he could have broken it. He had changed out of his uniform, but he still wore his serious face. Dad, I didn't mean to be late. I was just biking around and we lost track of time and... Who's we? Jake and Michael and me. I didn't realize it had gotten so late because we were... The same guys you let jump into freezing water? Who let you jump into freezing water? What were you guys up to? Dad's eyes were on me. We were just biking and stuff and... Just biking all this time? I don't want to hear any more excuses right now. Go eat the stir fry I saved for you before the, your mother gets back. If you hurry, she should have, you should have time to do the dishes and your homework by then, too. We'll have to see how she feels about grounding you. I slunk back into the kitchen, knowing better than to argue anymore with Dad. I scowled at Kiana from her peeking spot on the upstairs landing. It wasn't fair. Getting in trouble for trying to save a sea lion? Why couldn't Dad understand? I hadn't done anything wrong. Who would save the sea lion now, and what if Jake or Michael went back before me? All night I thought about how I could get back to the spot. Mom and Dad still hadn't listened to my story and had grounded me from using the phone, but not from using my bike. They knew it was the quickest way for me to get to school, and that's how I'd get back to the beach. I'd bike back the next day alone. When Dad's heavy knock on my door woke me up the next morning, all I could think about was how much I wanted to keep sleeping. Then I remembered the sea lion and my plan to save it. I sprang out of bed and quickly got ready for school. When I got to the kitchen, Mama's face reminded me that I was still in trouble. She looked at me with disappointment in her eyes as she went to Kiana, do Kiana's hair. That's when I slowed down. What had I been thinking? I didn't want them mad at me anymore. The plan I'd thought up was crazy. I couldn't risk getting in trouble again like I had the day before. But why hadn't they let me explain? I started feeling angry and scraped the chair loudly as I pulled it away from that table. Dad stared at me over his newspaper with his don't-start-with-me look. I tried not to look his way as I sat down to eat my cereal, but a headline caught my attention. What's wrong now? Dad confronted me as I stared at his, his way. I tilted my head to read the article from Dad's lowered paper. Local news. Sea lion escapes. A sea lion pup caught in a crevice swam away shortly after aquarium workers arrived. They'd received numerous phone calls from beachcombers about the young sea lion, which had been spotted as early as Tuesday. When workers arrived, however, the sea lion just swam away. It had probably lost weight being stuck there for a few days commented one of the aquarium outreach employees. That's the sea lion I found yesterday, I blurted out. Dad squinted at me, waiting for an explanation. Before I could stop myself, words flowed out of me like rain the night before. I found the stranded sea lion, and I wanted to free him, and then it looked like a storm was coming, and... When did all this happen? Dad looked at me. Well, we were biking, I said, moving my eyes back down the article. Dad looked at me, as if I, he were putting together a puzzle. After several minutes, he said quietly, Well, I'm glad to know you don't hate being near the water anymore. He shook his head in disbelief. My son, Antoine Graves, rescuer of sea lions, he chuckled. But I don't save it. I didn't save it. I wanted to. I wish I had been the one to do it. Then I wondered, what would have happened if I had been able to touch it, feed it, or move it? Would I have helped? I looked back at the article, relieved that the sea lion had escaped and that I didn't have to ex execute my plan. When I looked up, I caught Dad smiling at me the way he does when he's with his friends. I don't think he saw a know-nothing little boy anymore. He looked the way I'd always wanted him to be. Proud. <laughs>